was just at the Gulf Tech Summit this morning, um, which I, I still can't believe what happened. So the, the keynote speaker was meant to be Justin Trudeau from 9.15 to 9.45, and the previous speaker decided to oh, like I speak said, I'm not that for, an she had three minutes allocated, and she just spoke also. for 22 minutes. Asking more questions. Um, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> if I would keep ahead of stage, waiting yeah. while I speak, I should. <laughs> Okay, good morning everyone. I think it's the right time to start our session because we've already 10, time, 10 minutes past the designated time. So this um, session will be more about um, history of the multi-stakeholder model and we also want to talk about how the multi-stakeholder model is practiced um, in the internet governance field and we also want to talk about how this multi-stakeholder model can be developed in the future or how it can be directed towards some other um, ways than it was taken, it has been taken so far. So I'm going to introduce you today's panelists one by one from my left side. So Marcus Kummer. So Marcus Kummer is an internet governance and policy expert with extensive experience in government, especially the United Nations internet institutions like ICANN, and he was also the board member for ICANN as well. And he also used to work with the Internet Society, and from 2004 to 2011, he worked for the United Nations first as the executive, the executive coordinator for the working group on internet governance, and subsequently, um, the secretary supporting the internet governance firm. So she was there even before the IGF was even before IGF came into the reality. And Marcus served as a career diplomat in several functions in the Swiss Foreign Ministry between 1979 and 2004. He is now based in Geneva, Switzerland. And Sandra. So Sandra is the Secretary General of the European Dialogue on Internet Governance, EURDIG, which is the European IGF. She became involved in the internet governance process in 2006 by coordinating in Chilea, the European Summer School on Internet Governance, which is EUROSIC, and participating at ICANN's at large advisory committee and the NOMCOM. Sandra's, Sandra's contribution both to the ICANN community and the efforts within the IGF fora and are dedicated to facilitate a collaborative ground for different stakeholder groups and to develop participation process that are open and transparent. In 2017, she was appointed Euro IDs Strategy Committee and is, since May 2018, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of Euro ID, the registry for the .eu domain. And the next is Aiden. He is um, a tech policy fellow right now with the Mozilla Foundation, where he is researching the ongoing development and harmonization of global privacy standards and laws. And um, at, right next to Aiden is Professor Kowei Wu. Kuo, Kowei Wu has extensive knowledge in the internet policy matters. Between 1984 and 1987, Kowei Wu worked for Cray Research, and this was the time for him to use the internet. And between 1987 and 1988, he worked for Multiflow Computer Corporation. And between 1988 and 1990, he backed to, he went back to work for Cray Research again. And between 1990 and 1998, he um, operated one of, the, one of 
the first supercomputing centers in the AP uh, in, in the AP region and began to deal with the internet and supercomputing policy back then. And he also used to serve as a board member in ICANN as well. And he also used to work for Thai, um, Chunghua Telecom International. And he also used to work to implement IPv6 policy as well. So thank you for coming. And because this session will be more about the round table, we really anticipate you to participate a lot, just coming to, just coming for, just coming forward and ask any questions about multi-stakeholder model, um, even between the panelist chair talking about what they're saying. And you can also um, tell about what's happening in your region, considering the multi-stakeholder model and we'll expect a lot from your participation. Thank you. So um, to begin this session, we just wanted to listen to more about how IGF came to be and how multi-stakeholder model was adopted um, consi considering this IGF. So we just want to listen to yeah, Marcus Kummer's um, history lesson a little bit. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Good morning and hello to you all. Uh, I said when we prepared the session, I'm not going to give a long speech and I'm definitely not going to prepare a big presentation. As many of you uh, have, are long-standing uh, participants in the IGF, let me just make a few points and I hope uh, if you have questions or if you think I'm off the track, uh, keep shouting and I hope to be as interactive as possible. But uh, let me just uh, explore a few areas, first of all the use of the term multi-stakeholder, look back a little bit at the history, but then also look at the function of the different organizations and lastly maybe also uh, have a few th thoughts on the role of governments. Now multi-stakeholder has become a very popular term and by now absolutely everybody claims to be multi-stakeholder. We have uh, from ICANN, uh, IGF to start with, ICANN, ITU, the World Economic Forum, uh, they all say they are multi-stakeholder organizations. Uh, and it obviously has different meaning to different people, but uh, somehow I feel the inflationary use of the term, it's like inflation and money, the more inflation you have, the less value you have of the money, and that also uh, maybe inflationary use of the term diminishes the value because we don't really know what we're talking about. That's why. It may be useful to look back a bit uh, at the history. And words, they come and go, and they are fashions. I do remember back in the 1990s, the absolute fashion was PPPs, public-private partnerships. That was then seen as the silver bullet to uh, solve all the problems, especially in uh, development cooperation. And uh, multi-stakeholder was not that much in use. Although it was practiced. The big summits of the 90s to start with from Rio opened up greatly to non-governmental actors, to civil society, to a business and that the inclusive character was very much part of the concept of sustainable development but they did not use the term multi-stakeholder. In 98, uh, a pivotal year for ICANN when ICANN was set up as an organization to administer the domain name system. The term was not used multi-stakeholder. It was then used the private sector-led. ICANN was a private sector-led organization as opposed to government-led organizations, to intergovernmental organizations such as UNESCO in whose uh, building we are meeting today. Uh, and WISIS, uh, the plenipot in Minneapolis, uh, started the WISIS process and the General Assembly resolutions calling for a World Summit on the Information Society. Again, they did not use the term multi-stakeholder, they used governments, but they should also include private sector and civil society. So, so I have a question. So yes. back then it was more about like multilateralism, what the government was expecting from the uh, it, it was set up as a classical summit where governments sit on the top of the pyramid or in the front of the room and the other actors sit behind. Mm -hmm. And that was very much the discussions we had. I do remember the very 
time of WSIS in 2002, there was a painful exercise in establishing rules of procedure. Okay. Governments, some governments wanted to make sure that there was not much, too much room given to non-governmental actors, mm. and they clearly were sitting in the back of the room. They were given maybe five minutes at the end before the lunch break when delegates already started packing up. And then was some time allotted to uh, civil society or business speakers. They organized themselves very well and they had their own bureau and so there was one speaker speaking on behalf of civil society but they only interfered right at the end. And then during uh, the WISIS process there were some minor improvements, some innovations. One innovation was actually discussed in this very building in July 2003 that maybe there should be an opening for non-governmental speaker after each agenda item. Instead of just coming at the end of the morning session, mm -hmm. that the chair should open the discussion to allow non-governmental speakers to come in at the end of an agenda item, then to the next agenda item, again, governments first. The end of the first phase of visits in 2003, uh, that was then a mandate given to the Secretary General of the UN mm -hmm. to set up a working group on internet mm -hmm. governance and that clearly said should involve all stakeholders mm -hmm. and there uh, that working group was able to uh, be innovative and there all participants of the working group, about 40 members of the working group on internet governance they represented all stakeholders and they participated as equals and we then also had open meetings where we interacted with the broader community and there again there was no hierarchy everybody was allowed to intervene uh, as uh, they wanted without uh, having to wait for governments first and this had an influence then on the second phase of this is which was much more open mm -hmm. and the IGF came out of that and adopted exactly the same methodology. So, so you mean that like from 1990 there were, there were a growing influence from the private sectors and they used to um, play, they started to play quite bigger roles compared to the previous years and this kind of like atmosphere was there but it was only after probably like 2003, um, this kind of like process, I mean the multi-stakeholder process, um, officially started to be adopted in the... It's, yeah. yes, uh, it's also the rules of procedure yes. for which we had adopted were sort of the state-of-the-art rules of procedure, right, right. but they were still very classical, mm. government-heavy. Mm. With this mm. working group on internet governance, we managed to break up this pattern and that influenced the second phase of WISIS and that was also much more open to non-governmental stakeholders. <coughs> when negotiating the first uh, outcome document of WISIS in 2003, I happened to chair the negotiating group on internet governance and that was then a government only group and there was the CEO of ICANN in the room, but I had to send him out mm -hmm. at the request of some governments. He was not allowed in. Mm -hmm. And that changed completely in the second phase of WISIS. Mm -hmm. And the mandate then given to the Secretary General was to uh, set up a forum to discuss public policy issues, and that based itself on the model of WIGIG, the Working Group on Internet Governance. And if you look at the outcome documents, the, uh, the outcome document of Geneva 2003 yeah. mentions multi-stakeholders two or three times, mm -hmm. but in rather obscure context, mm -hmm. whereas in uh, the Tunis outcome document, the Tunis agenda, has multi-stakeholder all over the place, and that was taken from the, working, mm -hmm. the report of the working group on internet governance. And when then the IGF was set up. The model clearly was a multi-stakeholder model where all stakeholders participate as equals. But again, <clears throat> the group that is known as, as MAG, now multi-stakeholder advisory group, right. to begin with was just called advisory group. Mm, so it was not multi-stakeholder. And then uh, the term was not used. Yeah. And then by 2008, yeah. we used the term multi-stakeholder advisory mm -hmm. group 
as informally it had been used by mm. especially civil society. Mm. And from 2008 onwards, also the UN used it in all official mm. press releases. Mm. But <coughs> that is maybe a good segue to also look at the function. Mm. The IGF, the function is not an operational function. Mm. The IGF is here to discuss policy issues and the multi-stakeholder format was amazingly well accepted by all stakeholders, including governments. We were slightly apprehensive ahead of the first meeting, but we did see a member, there was one workshop room where a representative of a government was sitting on the floor because there were no chairs left, which is unthinkable in the traditional UN context, but that was accepted and most participants felt this open format led to open and vibrant discussions and that in a, is in essence the success of the IGF that it allows stakeholders to come together as equals. But again, the IGF has no direct responsibility, has no operational responsibility. <coughs> ICANN, the internet organizations, the RIRs, the ITF, they have operational responsibilities, so clearly they do need more a procedure in place than is necessary for the IGF. So like, um, <coughs> definitely younger generation, because I came into the internet governance field in 2016, so um, some, somehow it's quite, um, it's quite surprising to um, hear that there was actually no room for <coughs> private sectors to talk very in length, in very lengthy manners, um, back in back in like 2000 or even before that. So it was only after the multi-stakeholder model has been somehow like officially adopted by the UN system <coughs> that the private sectors could somehow come into um, the internet governance forums and talk. Um, was given the equal seats with the government sectors as well. That's what I got to. Well, this is maybe a slight exaggeration of the situation as it is, but it's just uh, uh, the private sector was always involved that the, the rights given to the non-governmental actors were more limited than in the IGF, so to speak. But the point I'm trying to make is it's possible to be so open and loose in many ways, as the IGF has no direct responsibility. Right. Whereas organizations that have a direct operational responsibility, yeah. such as ICANN for instance, that you need to have more procedure in place. And again, of the <coughs> organizations, the internet organizations, or the ISTARs as they're known as ICANN, the regional internet registries, there the question is, they say they're multi-stakeholder, but are they truly multi-stakeholder in the sense what is the role of governments? ICANN has a very sophisticated model that governments participate, but do they participate as equals? There are some governments who don't like their role in ICANN because they are there in an advisory capacity. They feel we are come in at the end of the process now, other people think that the governments have too much say in ICANN because they have, do they have a veto right? No, they don't, but they have a way to influence the board. But that's another discussion, but it is a question you may well ask. It's not like the IGF where everybody participates as equals in ICANN. The roles are very clearly distributed and there is uh, monopoly for policy development and that is with the generic name supporting organization and the GNSO is also very jealous of their role. But uh, clearly ICANN is not government led and that again brings us back to the origin of ICANN which was set up as a private sector led organization. Okay because you have mentioned GNSO and I know that Aiden is very active. He has been very active in GNSO as well. So I just want to pass the mic to Aiden so that he can just somehow talk about how you how you think about multi-stakeholder model <coughs> operating.
Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Aidan Berdeline, and I am a fellow with the Mozilla Foundation, and I'm also a counselor on the GNSO um, for the non-commercial stakeholders group. So I'm very cynical about multi-stakeholderism in general. I don't think it is particularly representative. I don't think it's particularly accountable. I'm not sure it necessarily leads to, uh, to good policy being developed. I think it can sometimes lead to policy being developed through exhaustion rather than through um, a reliance on evidence or a reliance on trying to reach the, the best possible outcome. And I think um, later when I speak, I, I, I'd prefer to speak a bit more broadly than, than I can and to speak about internet governance in general because I'm very cynical about the multi-stakeholderism that is practiced within ICANN itself because I think uh, there are certain stakeholders that have more muscle than others. Governments have muscle by virtue of state power. The private sector has muscle by virtue of uh, financial power and civil society is simply brushed aside and ignored. And I'm not sure that the institutional setup is really uh, designed to allow all perspectives to filter through versus perspectives to filter through where there may be some kind of um, benefit to what I would call the not, uh, uh, the not impartial um, organization that is responsible for ultimately implementing the policy that this multi-stakeholder community develops. Um, so I'm sorry for that healthy dose of um, realism that I just <laughs> um, added there. Um, because, um, it, would you like me now to speak useful about just multi-stakeholderism in internet governance? Yeah, well, um, that because um, that's something that I, I would sort of say that I think it's something that is desirable and it's something to be protected um, for so many reasons. It's just unfortunate that I think a lot of the case studies that we have of where it is applied aren't really great. Um, whether that is because of the lack of accountability, whether that is because of um, uh, m many issues, but and and increasingly, I'm wondering: is it even necessary? And that's a really provocative statement that I just made there as well. But I think we've seen in recent years that many of the reasons behind resorting to the model simply haven't proven to be true. So I guess there were two um, classical explanations for multi-stakeholderism. Firstly, that it was this natural extension of the Enlightenment and Jeffersonian democratic principles. Um, this idea that the exercise of political power without the consent of the government is illegitimate. And so multi-stakeholder governance meant that representatives of parties other than governments, be they um, private sector actors, be they public interest groups, um, other interested parties, could participate in the policy deliberations that would impact them alongside governments. That's good. And so that's how institutions like ICANN gain their legitimacy to govern I would, I would argue that they, they gain their legitimacy in direct proportion to which they facilitate the participation of the stakeholders impacted by the decisions that they make. I guess the second explanation for why multi-stakeholderism came to be was that one can't have a global infrastructure whose interoperability is dependent upon dozens of overlapping rules, overlapping frameworks, um, it just wouldn't work. And so to ensure that the internet continues to operate at this, this global commons, who's, the, the, these frameworks and policies had to be established in a way that would allow for interoperability. And open and transparent multi-stakeholder processes would facilitate this. Um, there was a traditional solution here, a historical solution that was avoided, which was global treaty organizations. We could have um, their regulatory approach would have provided for an overall commonality of frameworks, but they would not have provided for open, equitable, non-governmental participation. And they certainly would not have provided for open, equitable civil society participation. And so for those reasons, we sort of avoided the historical solution. And, and when I say we here, I, I, I really mean non-state actors and, and in particular civil society. So um, we, encourage governments not to regulate unilaterally. We encourage them to engage with others through these multi-stakeholder institutions to discuss and come up with solutions based upon shared values, mutual interests. And 
for a long time, that seemed to be the best approach. But I was thinking about this earlier this year when enforcement of the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation came into effect. And what this um, really validated was states taking extraterritorial regulatory measures and it working and enforcement actually happening. And I'm not saying this would work for every state, that every state is going to have the power, but I think that we've now, be it because of fortuitous circumstance or an intentional strategy that we missed two decades ago, that we now have proof that state interests can actually be uh, maintained through the creation of regulations that have an internet-wide effect. And that is something that I think is really interesting and worth watching over the coming years because I think we're going to see a variety of new regulations emerging from states with extraterritorial effect. And, um, and certainly as someone who, um, who, who researches the development and harmonization of data protection regulations, I'm not expecting to see any regulations emerge that are radically different from the GDPR. So I think what we've also seen is that there's this real first mover advantage. So the outsized need for stakeholders to comply with the first law that um, um, comes to market, so to speak, will effectively preclude other frameworks, be they stronger or weaker, from getting due consideration. And so I think that is also something really interesting. So I'm going to leave my remarks here. I think I, I made a few um, provocative statements. Um, feel free to approach me and to, uh, to, to discuss further, but I, I guess what I, I sort of insinuated here is that the European Union kind of displaced the multi-stakeholder model with the multilateral model online, and it seems to be working. Um, and um, certainly a very shrewd approach if it was intentional, but, um, and, and certainly a, a valuable lesson in statecraft for all involved. Yeah, thank you, Aidan, for that. And that was actually quite helpful. You, I mean, I said I was not cynical, but you had said you were cynical, but I also questioned whether ICANN is truly multi-stakeholder in the same sense the IGF is. And there are reasons for that. I mean, the, the IGF is really something sui generis uh, with no direct responsibility. And my next point would have been exactly that. I was going to say, who remembers John Perry Barlow? He used to be the lyricist of the Grateful Dead, but he was also, the, he declared the independence of cyberspace in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of strong belief we don't need governments anymore, but now we clearly see governments are back. And the GDPR is a very good example. And in many ways, uh, there's, uh, in the past few years, there many have sort of said multilateralism versus multi-stakeholderism. Uh, and I would also question whether that is not a false dichotomy in a sense. The IGOs have clearly opened up to a great extent to non-governmental actors. They recognize the real expertise is quite often outside the world of governments. And that was also clearly what led to the formation of ICANN as the US government felt. <coughs> uh, an IGO would not be well equipped to deal with a fast moving uh, technology. <coughs> but governments are back, but we have not yet quite found the right balance on how to work with governments. They want to jump on the train, that is clear, but we have to make sure that they don't derail the train as they're jumping on it. With that, I conclude and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. okay, so I just want to make, um, pass my mic to Sandra because she has been also working in like European IGF as well. So I definitely <coughs> believe that she has a lot more to talk about all these processes and multi stakeholder model as well. So how do you think it's actually like being practiced within the European continent? Mm -hmm. Well, I can really speak as someone who's trying to offer a platform or the healthy environment for a multi-stakeholder process. And first of all, before I also get a little bit critical here, I want to make clear that I really 
wholeheartedly support the multi-stakeholder model. I think that's the best model to move forward with. It's not perfect, as democracy is also not perfect and not even reality in all countries in the world, but it's probably the form of uh, state that everyone is heading to. And I think for uh, the regulation of the internet, and I also think for regulation um, of other sectors like energy or climate, multi-stakeholder model should be the, the model that should be aimed at. But as I said, it's not perfect. From Marcus' intervention, I understood the big achievement from the RISIS process was that civil society for the first time was not standing out of the door or outside protesting, but had no right to speak when uh, groups came together and um, started to discuss um, the digital future. Um, but now, meanwhile, we see that civil society is the biggest stakeholder group, at least in the IGF. And uh, this has also some backlash because we are missing out other stakeholders. We are missing to a great extent the technical community and we are missing the private sector. And here it is the same as we would miss civil society in the past. If you miss one stakeholder group, the whole module becomes obsolete. And therefore we really have to strengthen our efforts to involve all stakeholders equally and um, as an organizer I'm asking myself how to do this just by inviting them they are not coming it it has a cost implication implication it has time implications so they decide am I going there or do I not and therefore this call for more tangible outcome uh, is on the table personally I think if we would <coughs> have an IGF where we negotiate a declaration or something at the end, we would really lose the openness of the debate. Just imagine big companies are attending the IGF because they want to have their little piece in, in the declaration, same place for government. I think this would, on the other hand, push back and silence civil society again. So I don't think that's a solution that we come up with um, declarations, outcomes whatsoever. At Eurodic we invented, and I'm sorry if I do a little bit promote now, but at Eurodic we prevented those messages. Messages is a rather neutral term. It is a recommendation. It is something that comes out, but it's not something what was negotiated in a way. And uh, the IGF last year started also to produce messages, and I hope they will continue this year, because I really think this is a, term, a type of outcome that you can put forward, that you can revisit uh, one or two years after and see what, what happened in the past. I think there is still a lot of space for improvement. Then um, something I also realized when we are trying to reach out to new communities, for instance, insurance sector, banking sector, health care sector, pharmacy, they are all affected by what we call internet governance. <coughs> but if we go to them and say, you should participate in an internet governance forum and discuss the regulation of the internet, they, they just don't understand. They, it, it's, it's really difficult. And just imagine this term, internet governance, translated into multiple languages. It is really confusing. Sometimes it's totally misunderstood just by the way it is translated. And sometimes, as uh, Marcus said already, people have different understanding about multi-stakeholderism and about internet governance. So I personally started to find new words, easier words, that make it easier for those we want to actually uh, reach out to understand. So what I am using at the moment, and I can't really tell you if I will be successful, but I'm saying we are uh, discussing to shape our digital future. It's a bit, more, a bit broader than just concentrating on the inter, on the network, on the connected computers. It uh, implies also that we are talking about uh, societal questions, about ethical questions. And this is much broader than just uh, discussing uh, the governance, the regulation of a network. So this is one of the efforts I'm trying to, to do. And then on the, on the issue of multi-stakeholder versus multilateral, multilateralism, there is a difference. Multilateralism is between one, two or more states. Multi-stakeholder involves all the stakeholders that are concerned. I think both models have 
uh, are justified, and they both have to exist. Sometimes states will, and they will not stop doing so, sometimes state will uh, negotiate, find a treaty, do a contract whatsoever, and this is multilateralism, and this is okay, but some questions you have to address in a more broader sense in the multi-stakeholder model. And Aiden, you just said it's exhausting sometimes we achieve results by exhaustment. Um, I know what you mean. I'm also involved in ICANN and know these <laughs> lengthy debates and processes. But I do see that there are also positive examples. For instance, the way the IANA transition was, was achieved. This was truly a, a shining example on how the multi-stakeholder model could and should work. So I'm deeply convinced that it is the best model to move forward. Results that come out of multi-stakeholder discussions will definitely be more sustainable, but they take time, and time is money. And this is the big issue, and this is uh, where we have to probably convince others to participate and to see the need to move forward and not just wait for, for an outcome or for something to negotiate. It is a societal debate that we have to do, and. I used to compare that with uh, the right to vote for women. I mean, in, not in every country women can already vote. But uh, for instance, Switzerland was one of the last countries in Europe where women were allowed to vote. It took three votes before they were allowed to vote. But the societal debate that took place beforehand, that was actually the important part. And this is what we are doing here. We are having a debate and the results, the outcomes, they will not necessarily be directly connected to our debate because we won't bring that one-to-one -one in connection with each other, but actually the results are based on the discussion that we are having here at forums like this. And I think that's such an important thing that we uh, should not stop moving forward, but improving and including, or improving by including all stakeholders equally. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, Sandra. And we definitely can say that multi-stakeholder, I mean, the term itself has come into the word um, only, um, only maybe um, 20 years ago, or even like 10 years ago. And we have also like witnessing that still a lot of debates are going on within inside the academic sphere as well about how we can define the multi-stakeholder model. <coughs> And I definitely can think, I definitely think that this model or, or this term itself is somehow like ongoing like discussion topic. And I want to pass the mic to Ko Wei Wu, professor, because he used to be working in the technical se sector and yeah, because um, he's going to have a lot of words. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, I start from the technical side. In the very beginning, actually, it was in the supercomputing. And the supercomputing actually dealing with uh, networking also. And so I was uh, participating in the networking since the uh, 1980s. And I think the Marcus gave a very good you know, uh, explanation how the uh, multi-stakeholder mechanism uh, inside the, uh, the UN system and also some of the ICANN stuff. Uh, let me back to see what is uh, the core issue of the multi-stakeholder mechanism now we are looking for. I think it's a very important is uh, what we are looking for, the multi-stakeholder mechanism is uh, open and transparent. Open and transparent is a critical and very important. Uh, the reason is the open and transparent actually is uh, the, the whole idea actually came from the very early day of the IETF meeting. There is an engineer, you know, on the internet standard uh, development meetings. And this idea actually is uh, try to find out what is the uh, internet standard and to be global acceptance. And so that is the idea they always are running in the open and transparent. Although they, at the time they are not talking about so-called multi-stakeholder mechanism, but I think the core of the multi-stakeholder mechanism is a view from the IT of uh, the beginning. And then you are looking around the, that is uh, in ICANN, basically ICANN is only in charge of the three major things. 
the IP address, domain name, and then loop server man management or coordinations. But if you look at IR, the you know, regional internet registry in charge of the IPv4, IPv4 policy stuff, basically the regional internet registry IR in the five different continents, they're actually running in a membership base. You, know. you have to be the membership. And so, but when they are talking about policy, it's open, anybody can make a comment into the you know, the uh, IP address uh, policy is uh, open. You don't need to be a member. You can participate in this uh, policy. So in that case, you can see that from the I IETF go to the IR, they always is uh, doing this uh, open and transparent. And I think uh, let me briefing a little bit, you know, put a little bit in more information in the Marcus talk. Actually, multi-stakeholder, this idea is uh, coming into the 1998 because at a time, uh, the many government actually arguing how the IANA is uh, located, how the IANA should be located and how the IANA should be operations. And somehow in the United States, the U.S. government the U.S. government at the very beginning, they uh, agreed to go to a new corporation. And uh, particularly outsourcing to the Harvard Law School to developing kind of constitution today we call is the bylaw of the, the ICANN. And at the time they are begin to put kind of the multi-stakeholder into the ICANN bylaw. And that is, uh, I, I remember there's a, uh, uh, the, the famous uh, law professor, Lauren Lasix, is in charge to developing this uh, bylaw. And two of uh, his students, Andrew and also Jonathan Zitran, is uh, involved in, in to developing the bylaw. And the bylaw of the ICANN actually developing what we see today, the so-called multi-stakeholder mechanism. If you look at the, you know, the stakeholder in ICANN, you're talking about GNSO, ASO, you know, uh, at the time also have a protocol supporting organization. You know, and then they began to developing so-called uh, individual, the uh, general public, how they can represent the, their position into the ICANN mechanisms. And so this is a kind of uh, coming back to some kind of the ICANN. And I don't need to go on further regarding for the WSIS and the IGF, and that is the markets already common. But only one thing I want to add in here. If I remember in the second meeting, WSIS meeting in the Tunis, actually in the government, they are looking at the potential possibility how to locate the IANA or ICANN. They even propose uh, four or five different model how the ICANN should be belong. You know, inside the UN system or, you know, related, strong related to the UN system. But by the end of the WISIS uh, meeting in the Tunis, there's actually no conclusion regarding for the INA or ICANN located. And so they began to generate so the IGF right now. And in 2005, I think the markets already commented that, that is how the multi stakeholder mechanism come into the IGF. And I think it's an it's a important thing that the multi stakeholder mechanism is uh, particularly today. Uh, we all know we have a lot of problem in the, you know, the, the real war. You know, just to take a one simple example, you might be, everybody have an experience about that. For example, like Uber. Uh, Uber kind of uh, try to run the global operation. But in many countries, they have a trouble with a local taxi regulation or policy. And so you can see some of the country allow the Uber to run their operation or business. But some of the country or city, they say no. And what is the problem? The major problem is because the Uber, the platform is running globally. You know, and so, it's very important so some of the, you know, the, the one of the panelists are talking about the GDPR. I think that is a critical, particularly if you remember once upon a time that's uh, talking about the intellectual property issue is, uh, 
in the U.S. the Congress, you know, they are arguing about how to protect the intellectual property. And also in the U EU system, talking about the uh, actor, you know. The similar problem is uh, because uh, the, the technology and uh, the platform actually running global, worldwide. But when you're dealing with this issue, maybe you only in the, is a, is a, is a domestic. But how you can balance the, you know, the technology, global technology to the domestic issues? And so this is, I think, is a, a lot of things we need to learn. And actually, I think that's uh, one of the major, you know, the, the issue is, uh, you know, how we can go through the multi-stakeholder mechanism to allow the different stakeholder to come into their voices uh, before the government set up the policy or set up the regulation. I think that is, uh, that is uh, one of the reasons. And the main purpose of the multi-stakeholder mechanism for me actually means is open transparent because, uh, well, most of the government sometimes is like a black box, you know. Of course, it's not all, but some of the government actually is quite black box. You don't know what is the regulation, how the policy is developing. And the technology, technical people and business people, they only can have a very sly, you know, understand how the policy developments. And for looking for a better, you know, the, the, the coordination into this uh, technology and also the, the real world is happening. For example, we see many things happen this day. For example, like uh, artificial intelligence or uh, many different kind of the e-commerce operation. You are getting more complicated or sophisticated a system uh, in our business or in our you know, the daily life operation is that it's getting complicated. You are not living alone into your own hometown, you know. You, even you are living in a small city or a small town, but the, this global technology is uh, moving into your living room, you know. So how we can work it out to come out with a much better policy to fulfill or to resolve this issue. And I think that uh, might be is a value of the multi-stakeholder mechanism. And maybe the people say that is uh, some of the backdrop of the multi-stakeholder mechanism. I always try to say that, you know, the people, we don't have, a, usually we don't have a really the perfect solution. But what we can do, we actually try to, to have an um, optimized solution to resolve the issue, then we're going to in enhance or improve. And I think that is the reason we are sitting here to talking about the multi-stakeholder mechanism today. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments on um, how technologies have somehow overcome the world and how it became like globalized and how the government sectors and other private sectors um, just began to come in to um, regulate all these like private sectors and technologies. Um, so what I actually got to understand about multi-stakeholderism is that it can be actually thought of as some kind of evolution evolution of like social structure. Just like we got to have some kind of like evolution of technologies like such as internet um, to adapt to this kind of like new technologies, social, social like structure also needed some kind of like new firms or new structure, new organization to deal with all these kind of new technologies which, um, used not, which did not exist before. Um, but like, cause Aiden, you say that you are actually very critical about very cynical about like multi-stakeholder model um, and because you mentioned that actually the government started to play a large role and maybe a larger role. Um, so what do you think about this? I mean, do you think that the role of the government will just grow bigger and bigger or do you think that it can just rival, maybe rival with private sectors or other stakeholder, stakeholders? Thanks, you. So this is Aiden Bertolin for the record. Uh, I think that's, there's a potential for that. I think if we do not fix the multi-stakeholder model ourselves, if we do not uh, look at it critically and explore why it doesn't work or how we can actually improve it and actually improve it, and when I say we here, I mean those who are um, non-state actors, 
if we don't improve it, then yes, I think it is very possible that what will happen is that the multilateral model will take over. Now, if you ask me what are some concrete steps that we might be able to take to improve the model, I have a few suggestions that I would like to put forward. And I base these upon, um, as, as I mentioned before, I am on the GNSO Council, and the GNSO Council within ICANN managed a policy development process over the past few years for a working group that failed after three years. It was simply disbanded after hundreds of meetings, no outcomes, um, which is not great. But we did do something of a post-mortem afterwards to understand why this working group, the Registration Directory Services Policy Development Process Working Group, failed. And there were a few, a few causes that we identified. Um, one, that there wasn't an independent conflict resolution um, uh, process in place. And so every, I shouldn't say everyone, but some stakeholders uh, were prepared to um, to die over certain uh, requests that they wanted and others were prepared to die over the same issue and so we simply couldn't move forward. There was gridlock and so perhaps uh, when we look at ways that we reform the multi-stakeholder model we may need to make sure that there is a way to have some kind of independent conflict resolution and also to be able to have some kind of independent actor say um, make some kind of subjective determination as to whether someone is being reasonable or not. That's a really difficult conversation to have, but it might need to happen. We also thought maybe we need to become better at enforcing deadlines and breaking pieces down into um, bite-sized chunks, and how can we do that? We also thought about um, how do you review working group leadership? If you've had a working group going on for several years and there's no system in place to review the leadership to make sure it's functioning, can we fix that? And just to be clear, I'm not insinuating at all that the leadership that that particular working group had was deficient in any way. I don't think that. I think they had good leadership. But just as a sort of ongoing mechanism as the model matures, we do need to make sure that in environments where we're applying the model and perhaps in a working group setting, um, if something has not been making progress, maybe there isn't the right leadership structure in place. And then the f final uh, thought that we had in our postmortem, which is um, um, might seem at odds with the multi-stakeholder model, was also to consider alternatives to the open, bottom-up, participatory model that we had. So in that working group where you had hundreds of people on every call um, once a week uh, for a 90-minute call, it doesn't really allow time for anyone to speak or to make anything substantive. It also allows microphones to be captured, it allows for filibustering to happen. And so maybe there needs to be some flexibility to consider that maybe one, uh, one size fits all model isn't going to work. There needs to be different alternative models explored depending on the issue. And maybe you don't need every stakeholder to be participating in every discussion. Maybe you need to make sure that you have the relevant voices. Um, how you determine who the relevant voices are, how you ensure representation, that's a, another discussion. There are no easy answers here. But simply at a, at, a, at, a, at a high level, if I was to say, if we think about how can we improve the model moving forward, that's something we might want to consider. Because multi-stakeholderism, I think, is not working at the moment, as well as it should. But I agree with, and I echo the thoughts of Sandra and others, that it is important and has to be safe. Okay, thanks. And I think Sandra might have something to do. Okay. Can I comment about? I'd like to make a comment about, you know, you are talking about the multi-stakeholder mechanism isn't that work. I don't think, I don't think so. You know, first of all, in the early day, if you're thinking about the government of the international organization when they are making set it up of the policy, usually only the government and then might be some of the business sector try to talk to the government and try to understand that. Or maybe they are talking with an uh, NGO, you know, the academic or, or some of the community. But one thing is uh, usually be ignored, it's a technical community. Uh, the point is uh, right now in the world, right now we are running, almost everything running on the internet. So it's critical issue is, uh, is that internet if you don't know what you're going to break, then we have to 
be very careful about what is the internet structure is running in here. So if you look at no matter it's a, a domestic, a national, the government, or international organization, I think at least right now they are beginning to recognize that the technical community is, uh, the Im information is important. To give, for example, you are talking about the GDPR is uh, one of the ex issues. So of course I, I, I'm not saying the multi stakeholder mechanism is going to solve everything, but I think at least it's a generally a, a kind of two things is important in this uh, whole, the domestic policy or international policy to developments. First of all, is uh, now and more and more, you know, the government recognize open and transparency will make a better policy. I think this is the first point. I think there is uh, how the multi-stakeholder deliver the core value to the policy developments. The second of all, I think uh, just I'm saying, now the, the government when they developing the regulation of policy, for example, might be many of you know that many people expecting the 5G and now the people have to come in back to figure out how you can implement the technical solution for the 5G. It's not like in the early day, you just make an open bid and then resolve the issue. It's uh, many of the things might be not really, you are talking about the policy developing uh, everything based on the multi-stakeholder mechanism, but its core and its value is a uh, began gradually to accept it by the regulator to, you know, working on the policy. I think that is, a, that is my point. Thanks. Okay, so I heard that there is a question from... Yes, yeah, I have one. Uh, it's from Mokaberry. Uh, it's from Tehran University. It's a PhD in cyber norms and media. Uh, and the question is, it's a question and a comment. And hello. Okay, hello, cyber norm making and cyber rules must be formed in UN framework by participation of all key stakeholders in more democratic and more transparent and fair internet governance model. Otherwise, how can we trust American internet, okay? Peaceful internet is formed only under UN framework. And the, great, the great, greatest enemy of internet is digital uni, unilateralism and digital protectionism. With this approach that is clearly reflected in US national cyber strategy, strategy 2018, how other countries can trust US on the internet and what the meaning of norm, norm making? US, UN, US unilateralism and nationalist policy will soon lead to internet fragmentation. What must be done? Maybe we need to listen to the question again. Did anyone catch the question? Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is a sort of question we heard right at the beginning of the internet governance uh, discussions, which was essentially about the role of one government, uh, and that was seen as not the appropriate way of dealing with a global resource. We had long discussions during WISIS, and uh, since then a lot has happened as well. I mean, with the IANA transition, the US government has withdrawn from its oversight role over ICANN and the IANA function. Uh, but obviously, ICANN is still located in the US, and uh, this is uh, still I think at the heart of the comment, uh, that was also very much at the beginning of the debate, many governments felt then that the internet should be dealt with as a global resource, like most other global resources, by an intergovernmental organization, preferably under a UN umbrella. And that is essentially what we are talking about here. It's not so much multi-stakeholder versus multilateral, it is government-led versus non-government-led. And clearly the internet is dealt with in a non-government-led way by the community and in decentralized organizations. And they are adapted to the distributed structure of the underlying technology. The internet is also a distributed technology. And one single organization would be at odds with uh, the underlying technology. 
ICANN has gained more prominence than the, the names for, are more emotional than the numbers, but uh, the same applies to the numbers. And I think one very good argument to defend the existing system is it actually works. And that's uh, how I think the main uh, legitimacy the organizations that are actually running the internet have it from the fact that the internet works. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And I heard that there is another question from the floor. So, okay. Thank you very much. I present myself. I am Nasser Haji, professor of University in, te in Telecommunications, ICT, and Economics. And I have been the president of the Plenipotentiary Conference of 2002 in Marrakesh, when at this time the Mr. Mr. Utsumi as the General Secretary, and I a former Minister of Telecommunications and ICT in Morocco. So it, it's just a, a, a question and a comment in the question. You know that ITU, or the International Telecommunication EU, I think it's the more ancient organization, international organization in the world. It was created in, in 1860. At, at this time, it was International Telegraph Union. Then it became to telecommunications, then to ITU. And it began, it comes uh, in, uh, uh, something depending of the United Nations, when the United Nations was created first, first as uh, in, uh, in 2000, the, uh, in the 1918 to then 1945. My question is that we have some lot of problems in the governments of internet. There are technical problems standardization and all that, like that was in ITU for telecommunications. You have also juridical or legal problems, privacy and a lot of things like that. You have technical issues like the big data and the, the artificial intelligence and all that. You have economic issues. You have social and political cultural issues. And we are just at the beginning of this evolution. It's taking, I, I followed the evolution of telecommunications and internet, and it was very fast. And we are just at the beginning because a lot of questions are emerging now. So my question is how to have an efficient model. The intergovernmental model, like was the ITU, works for something when there are telecommunications monopolies. Then after there was private sector in mobile telephony and then in internet and big actors of this private sector. What was tried in Marrakesh and that was time Mr. Vinton Cerf was present in Marrakesh, the president of ICANN, is how to find something working efficiently this international global forum is very interesting, but it's not working on an operational way. It's just a bidding, a forum, and the, the question that we have is how to make different stakeholders or different persons, government, organizations, a private society mobility, work together for this new soy city we are creating and building. So it's a huge question, and there is no a perfect model, but what we can do is to improve the models and adjust till we, we find this, uh, this. And that was the history of telecommunications from the 19th century. Thank you very much. Um, let me try. There is a big question. Okay. Let me try uh, to from my point of view. I think, yes, um, basically, the difference of the ITU and also regarding for like, and I think a lot of the people might be 
uh, a little bit, I try to say clear the I can roll. Actually, I can only deal three things I mentioned about the IP address, domain name, and the loose server coordination or management. Uh, regarding for the e-commerce or something like that, that on top of the application is not really into the ICANN uh, schema, okay? But the, the point is uh, the, the development structure of the ITU and also we are see today in the internet. The major difference is uh, in the ITU is a much like an international organization structure. So if we are looking at how the, the, the telecom, telephone or you know, telephone system is uh, developing to really uh, go into the, the worldwide population, we took almost uh, 50, 100 years. The internet is not developing in that way. The internet actually developing is a kind of uh, not centralized, not centralized. So for the people, if you want to get into connect to the internet, it's getting easier. You don't need to have a kind of the national carrier in the past, in the old day, you know, uh, today's a telephone company to provide you the service. The, any people, if you can get on the internet through whatever channel, then you are part of the internet population. So you can see why the internet population is grow so fast. So I think the two different approaches from the telephone and also the internet, they generate a different issue and different questions, okay? So I think, uh, yeah, I, I agree, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, that is, uh, might be, might be we can talk about, you know, of course, uh, the, the particularly in the ICANN, the people continue talking about accountability issues, you know, and, the accountability issue in the ICANN is uh, more than just, uh, you know, the, the, the accountable to the supporting organization, the particularly you want to talking about is how they can accountable to the global user. You know, I think there is a, there is a uh, kind of the differences and in the ITU, you know, we always go through the government and to understand how the private sector or the individuals. So I think this is the, two major differences in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the past. Okay, thanks. And there was a question from the floor, so. Claudio. Hmm? Claudio. Okay, Claudio. I'm sorry, it's not clear to me whether you're calling on me or someone else. Please. Yeah, no, 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 no. You, you can, yeah, Claudio can go first. All right, yeah, okay. thank you very much. This is Claudio Lucena, Paraiba State University in Brazil, Foundation for Science and Technology in Portugal. Uh, I've, uh, I'm also a, a community member at ICANN, involved in, in, in internet governance, regional forums, and, uh, and schools on internet governance also. And I, and, and I was listening to my fellow professor here and uh, stating the existence of, a, of, the, of the international organization that is there for not more than 150 years. And this, and this uh, multilateralism, the, this model, we have been patient enough with it for over 150 years, and yet it doesn't solve all the problems it was designed to address from start. And we have been patient enough with that model. Now, multi-stakeholderism as we know it in this space is here, are a couple of decades old, maybe two decades, and the way we know it, the Internet Governance Forum has, hasn't been there for, for that long, and regional movements of Internet Governance Forums are just starting. So I do acknowledge that we need to have more concrete outputs and results, and I congratulate Eurodig on, that, on, the, on the message exercise that we had this year from Tbilisi. I, I do understand that there are, that are financial constraints in that, in that too. The, 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 there is money that finances this model in the way we want to build it. But the fact of having the voices, even if they are not the most adequate and the most relevant ones at this moment, it's different from the models that we had in the past. Even if we talk about ICANN, because it's, it's interesting, I share with, with Aiden the same concerns about ICANN. 
but I do not share the same skepticism or cynicism about the model itself and the outputs because I do not see many more other uh, international corporations or organizations whose board sits in front of the community and answers direct questions several times a year. Does that solve all the organizational problems? Far from doing that, absolutely, right? But this is something different and we're experiencing something different for a couple of years only. So my, my call here is even acknowledging the difficulty that we face, even acknowledging the financial constraints on putting that model to work, let's not lose the patience with the multi-stakeholder model when it's just starting to produce its first results. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And Sandra, can... Um, I can just echo what you're saying and uh, to give clarity, the IGF, for instance, we are now in the 13th edition, aren't we? With 13, you are a teenager. <laughs> so if you look at the IGF with the mild eye of a parent that gives his teenager face strength to develop, I, I really can only echo what you say. ICANN is a little bit older, but the ICANN model is, is slightly different. And for me, that's actually one of the best functioning multi-stakeholder models I know, and I must say I don't know any others, and I'm interested in if any one of you knows another model where the decision-making capacity is in a multi-stakeholder, because this is the big difference, the decision-making capacity. At IGF level, we are discussing, we are, we are talk shop. But I said earlier why I consider a talk shop to be so important. And um, if anyone has other uh, models of multi-stakeholderism, I would be really interested to learn about. I, I'm not aware of any. So as for the IGF, think about it. We are a teenager. Thank you. And there was another comment from the floor. So could you... Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Ted Hardy. I'm the chair of the Internet Architecture Board, which is part of the Internet Engineering Task Force and an advisory board to the Internet Society. Um, I wanted to uh, make two replies, one of which was to the gentleman who was concerned about uh, the mechanisms of the IGF and how they would relate to the ITU. And I wanted to say that there are voluntary technical organizations which are concerned with advancing the Internet, which do come here to the IGF to hear uh, what other parts of the community say. Um, as it happens, my colleague uh, Alyssa Cooper, who's the chair of the ITF, is on a different panel in this particular thing, but I'm sure she would be here otherwise. And I believe that the cooperation among the technical community and uh, IGF and the rest of the communities is an important part of why this as a community and a multi-stakeholder effort uh, works, because different people are willing to come together and listen to each other um, in ways that might be more difficult if we went and uh, tried to participate in ITU uh, processes. Uh, the second thing is I, I will uh, let the gentleman know that uh, the ITF sits its leaders in front of itself uh, three times a year and we um, uh, sit in front of uh, our colleagues to, to listen to uh, whatever concerns they might have and to make changes. And I believe that one of the critical things about the long-term success of the IETF as a technical body is its radical openness. It has no membership, it has participation. Anyone may participate in any effort that's part of the IETF. And uh, you can do that by being um, part of a mailing list um, or part of a, some other technical uh, effort like a GitHub repo. Uh, but in all of those cases, there is absolutely no barrier to entry beyond that which is imposed uh, by understanding the technical topic and unfortunately understanding it in English. Um, I think that there are methods that um, the history of the ITF uh, suggests might eventually come into the IGF, in particular making more of the efforts uh, based in internet technologies rather than meetings. That radically lowers the costs and it makes possible to sustain long-term efforts uh, throughout a year. And I believe that those are available to us as we try and improve the multi-stakeholder process that we see before us. Thank you for your attention. 
Hi there, my name is Colin Curry. I just wanted to briefly respond uh, that there are quite a lot of multi-stakeholder initiatives in other sectors. So everything from disaster response to uh, environmental management to world health or even airline slot management is an example of multi-stakeholder decision-making processes. So I think that it's really important that within internet governance spaces, we don't consider ourselves too unique because we might lose the opportunity to take lessons learned from other sectors and apply them here. Thanks. Okay, thanks, and I think that's really an important point because we were actually like, the panelists were actually just trying to find out what there are some kind of like other multi-stakeholder models can exist outside the internet governance. Um, and I think that's really important to know that like there is some kind of like other um, um, field in which multi-stakeholder models started to exist and started to function very well. And I also think for the chair of IAB as well. Um, and I really agree that this um, IGF just started to um, function. I mean, and it, because I, I, we all agree that like IGF somehow lacks the potent of decision making. But we also know that this kind of conversation is really important. Like this is an actually very critical process because we can just all different stakeholder all different stakeholders can actually understand what kind of like problems are going on um, outside their own interests. Um, and I think concerning that, this IGF is really an important place to talk about all these issues to make the internet open and transparent. And if any, is there any other comments? Sure. Yeah. I'd like to echo the previous, uh, the, 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 you know, the <coughs> flow talking about it. Uh, if I remember in the 2003 and 2005, the WSIS meeting, you know, I go to the WSIS meeting and I think many of you might be know that. The session actually running in the, uh, the morning, 9, 9 p.m., uh, 9 a.m. to the, you know, 5 p.m. And that is only the delegate have the most of the time can talk. And if I remember in the morning session and the afternoon session, it's only 15 minutes for the rest of the peoples. So that means many of you are sit sitting here in the old way of the witness meeting. Actually, you, you cannot get a microphone to talk. And I think that is a, at least that is a one of the key value of the idea of the multi-stakeholder model to allow the people in the equal basis are talking about your point of view in re, re, no matter what issue is. And of course we understand that is uh, the, the, the issue in the internet right now is uh, so many and so complicated. And every government is uh, no matter the domestic or international is a face it. But I think at least the core value and they began to you know, uh, getting into the part of policy or regulation the process. I think at least, at least uh, one of the successful of the multi-stakeholder mechanism is uh, a, in place. Uh, that's my personal point of view. Okay, thank you. And I think it's the right time to wrap up this session. Thank you all for your comments and thank you all for coming here to talk about your opinions. And I just want to echo what Sandra has just talked uh, said that like IGF is just um, coming, he has just begun to experience its, um, what was it? Teenage. Yeah, teenage, yeah, the teenage, yeah, period. And I know that there are a lot of like similar sessions are going on in IGF this year. And I also know that NRI session is also gonna be about multi-stakeholder model. And I really wish that there are some kind of more talks about how multi-stakeholder model can be developed and can be further implemented in the IGA field. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank <laughs> you.